Graham says, uh, I'm George Chichekos. I am not George Chichekos, but he couldn't be with us today, so I'm going to try and stand into his shoes. Um, for those of you who don't know, GIC is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1975 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And our mission really is to encourage global dialogue on issues of import um, and encourage the free discussion of things like monetary policy, economic policy, health care, um, food and water scarcity, issues like that. We do programs all over the world here in Philadelphia and in the U.S. Uh, if you take a look at our, uh, our program upcoming, we have a uh, seminar set up for Dubai from Milan, Italy, uh, Jackson Hole. We'll be going back to Ghana this year, uh, as well as domestically here in Philadelphia, in Richmond, and in Sarasota, Florida. So again, I just want to thank everybody for coming. I'm happy to tell anybody more about GIC after the program. And with that, I'll introduce Peter Burns, who's going to introduce our panel today. Uh, Peter is a Senior Payments Advisor at Heartland Payment Systems, and he was the uh, progenitor of this topic today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. I'm going to be uh, very uh, uh, brief in my, my remarks because I think we've got a, a great program, and I think uh, we all want to hear from the program and not from me. Uh, so I'm going to dispense with things like the bios. There are bios in the, in the program booklet. You can read them as you'll be uh, sure that, uh, as, as I was, a, a very, very interesting and distinguished group of, of, of panelists for this, this topic discussion today. Uh, two real quick things on terms of logistics. Um, if you've got cell phones off, on, please turn them off. Um, and other important item is, is the, the, the ladies' rooms and men's rooms are kind of out that way to your left. And if um, I think that's probably the most important uh, information I can convey at this point in time. Um, the way that we're going to structure this, this meeting today is, is that um, our colleagues, our authors, will going to talk, talk about the paper, Steve and, and Richard, um, that they have been working on and the data sets that they've been developing and amassing and the problem that they've, been, that they've identified um, and perhaps even some stabs at, at potential solutions. But I think we're looking forward to um, having a, a, a more broader discussion on where we go from here kind of a thing. Following that, um, uh, Tony Santamira and Paul McCulley will make some remarks adding their perspective on what they've read and heard um, on, on about the paper. And then I want to open it up to an interactive discussion with, with you all. So I think I'd ask if we could just kind of hold questions until we've kind of had a chance for Paul and Tony to make their remarks. Um, and then I want to open it up and I'm hoping to leave at least an hour or so of, of interactive discussion. My <laughs> firm belief in these sorts of things is you get a, a good topic, which we do, and you have interesting people in the room, good things generally uh, follow. And so we're looking very much forward to, to your participation in this dialogue. So take notes and come up with questions and thoughts, and I'll come back and moderate that portion of the discussion later on. With this, let me turn this over to Richard Vague to introduce uh, the topic and his colleague. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, it's an absolute privilege to be here today with such a spectacular group of people. It's an honor to be in front of all you folks I tell you, to, to be given a speech and having Paul McCulley and Tony Santamara involved is quite something. Peter, thanks for your leadership on this, and Ben. And I tell you, I've been working for about 10 years with Steve Clemens. You're, you see his bio there. There's, there's nothing Steve can't do, and there's a, an enormous amount that I have learned from Steve, and he's really been my mentor in this project and in many others. Uh, so let's jump right into it. Uh, we all know that there's a raging debate between stimulus and austerity as regards government debt, federal debt. Um, and those that are against further stimulus will look at the bar on the left here, which is government debt to GDP. And by the way, we're going to be talking about the ratio of debt to GDP during this entire presentation. So they'll, they'll look at the ratio of government debt to GDP in 2011 and see that it's approaching 100%, and they'll be very alarmed about that. Folks that are proponents of further stimulus, however, will say, we'll look back at 1945, and our government debt to GDP was even higher back then. It was well above 100%, and our growth post-war really solved that problem for us. We're going to argue that this debate ignores a much larger issue, which is really going to be the subject of our talk today, and that is private debt. 
consumer and business debt added together. And if you do that, and you look at these two points in time, you can see that private debt to GDP was only about 60% in 1945. In fact, it, it declined to a nadir of 50% in 1950. And today, it is over 160% to GDP. Private debt to GDP in the post-war era has more than tripled. And we would go further and say that the rapid increase in private debt was in fact the cause of the Great Recession that we are str still struggling to emerge from. And let's look at that. If you look here, this is mortgage debt, consumer mortgage debt to GDP from 1960 to the present. And you can see from 1960 to 2000, mortgage debt to GDP increased by about 16% per annum. And then starting in 2001, something happened, and I'll just call it runaway lending. From the period of 2001 to 2007, mortgage debt to GDP increased 46%. It was roughly a growth from $5 trillion to $10 trillion, by the way. And in that 10-year period, it was growth of almost 70%, almost unprecedented uh, runaway growth in lending. And if I compare the 2007 peak in mortgage loans outstanding to a trend line that just carried forward that same 16% per decade growth rate, you would conclude that we made about $2.5 trillion worth of mortgage loans beyond that trend line. Uh, and higher asset values, by the way, are not a mitigant. At this point in time, we were talking about this earlier, but in 2005 and 6, I brought this to attention to a number of folks, a uh, number of prominent economists, and the rejoinder was, home values have increased more than debt values. So the net worth of consumers was actually increasing, in theory, during this period. Now, we know now that that was illusory. But the constraint on this is not asset values, but instead, it's income. And frankly, when you had the inevitable spate of non-payment of loans that should not have been made in the first place, that is in fact what brought the Great Recession. Now, why does high debt to GDP matter? And I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence with this slide but I feel compelled to touch on it at least for a moment. It seems obvious that if a home or business owner has a high level of debt, they have reduced capacity for additional spending and investment. Thus, it follows that a country, if in aggregate its consumers and businesses have a high ratio of debt, then that country will have a hard time uh, moving forward with high levels of spending and investment. And there are a lot of theories in economics that tend to discount, minimize, or omit this idea of debt under the, the theory that if you have a loan, you have a lender and a borrower, and it nets to zero. But that ignores the fact that that's very skewed. It's the great majority that are the borrowers and the small minority that are lenders. And if these, this great majority is constrained in its capacity to spend, you have an effect on the economy. So, private debt is what we're focusing on, and there's another reason we would pro focus on private debt to GDP, and that's because it's the biggest number. At the end of 2011, private debt to GDP, or private debt nominally was 25 trillion. GDP itself was only about 15 trillion. Public debt at this point in time was less than 15 trillion. The money supply, which of course gets discussed endlessly in this type of subject, M2, was only a little over 10 trillion. Exports were only about a trillion and a half. Tax receipts were only in the two to three trillion dollar uh, range. So a 10% increase in any of those other numbers, if you had a 10% change in tax policy or trade policy or anything else, it is dwarfed by a 10% change in private loan levels. 
And in fact, in the last decade, there was $9 trillion growth in private loans. $9 trillion entered the economy in a very compressed period of time. It's the most important factor. Another reason we would focus on private debt as opposed to public debt is it correlates more closely to GDP. Here you have three lines and you have a period on the left from 1970 to 2011. The red line is year over year growth in private loans. The blue line is year over year growth in GDP. And the dotted green line is year over year growth in public debt. And you can see that it's private debt that is more closely correlated to this. If you move to the right hand side of the chart, we look at Japan in the period from 1990 to 2011. And you can see the same phenomenon on an even more exaggerated basis. It's private debt growth that's driving GDP growth, not public debt. And frankly, if you picked any other country in any other slice of time, we've looked at a lot of slices of time in a lot of countries, it, this is generally true. Uh, by the way, if you did the same exercise and instead of Go, a private debt, you did M2 or trade imbalances or a lot of other things, I don't think you can find anything that correlates more closely than private debt. <clears throat> so, if runaway private lending caused the Great Recession, did it also lead to the Great Depression? So here's the data. Nominal lending levels from 1919 to 1935 and you can see that in the run-up to October of 1929, you had a 66% nominal increase in private debt. You had runaway lending. That's what brought the Great Depression. Now, let's translate that into debt to GDP. And here you see that same line from 1919 to 1929 expressed as a function of GDP so we can compare it to the period prior to the Great Recession. And here's the line for the 10 years prior to the Great Recession. They almost sit on top of each other. It's the same runaway lending phenomenon. And by the way, the amount of growth during this 10 year period is about 40%. It's a little different than some, it's 36 to 43% but it's right around 40%. So, if the 1920s and the 2000s had 40% private debt growth, how many other times in the last century has private debt growth been 40% in a single 10-year period? Well, here's the chart we're going to look at for the next few minutes, so let's orient ourselves to it for a moment. It is private debt to GDP is the blue bar in Public debt to GDP is the red bar, and the period is from 1916 to 2011. It's a little hard to get comparable data prior to 1916. And you can see uh, that there's kind of two mountaintops here. And there's only three periods in which private debt to GDP grew more than, or grew around 40% in 10 year period the 1920s, the 2000s, and then the late 40s to early 50s, a point at which private debt to GDP was at a century-long low. Now, the other thing you'll notice is those are the, the, the two periods in which private debt to GDP exceeded 150% are the 20s, and the 2000s. So the equation becomes pretty simple. If you have private debt to GDP of over 150% and you have growth in a 10 year period of over 40%, it's predictive. That's how you predict the next financial crisis. Now I want to pick out a couple, I want to point out a couple other things. If you have your handy little time machine and you want to be president of the United States and you can pick the point at which you want to be president, 
I suggest you pick a period in which private debt to GDP is low. And you'll notice there's another bump on this chart. The period in which private and public debt grew to, as a percent of GDP grew at, faster than any other period except the ones we've already pointed out was Ronald Reagan's tenure. The Reagan revolution was debt fueled which makes 1987 perhaps a little bit easier to understand. So the good news is we now have a tool for predicting, and I would go so far as to argue preventing the next major crisis of this mag magnitude. But how did we miss something so obvious? Well, we've already alluded to this. A lot of prevailing economic theories really kind of ignore or omit debt you know, there's a, ref there's, a, there's a term in economics, the real economy, and the real economy is like manufacturing and stuff like that and doesn't include consideration of debt. It's almost like it's a misleading term. Um, in addition, there's this kind of tacit assumption that debt growth is good. I mean, today, if you pick up the Wall Street Journal of the New York Times and there's an article about, you know, uh, lending increasing, it's... A happy article. Lending's increasing, therefore good times are in. The mortgage lending is increasing, therefore that's a good thing. Well, uh, that's true, but there's limits to that. And that limit appears to be in the 150 to 200 percent to GDP range. Well, we're still above that 150 percent private debt to GDP ratio. There have been a lot of articles we've few of us went to dinner last night and we talked about this, but there are a lot of articles that talk about, you know, the deleveraging that's occurred uh, sen it, since the Great Recession began. We're going to look at this specifically in a few slides, but the amount of deleveraging that has really occurred is relatively de minimis. And in fact, we have returned to a level that's at or slightly above the pre-crisis aggregate private debt levels. So if you buy this so far, and you think private debt is something to, to keep an eye on, how would you advise decreasing our high ratio of debt? We're going to discuss these a little bit, but you can pay down debt. That works. You can get government debt under control. You can grow your way out of the problem. You can inflate your way out of the problem. You can restructure debt, which of course is a euphemism for forgiving debt. And by the way, we're going to advocate this one. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it because it's fraught with emotional peril. But let me tell you, a trillion dollars in debt forgiveness would unleash a trillion dollars in consumer spending and in our view is superior to a trillion dollars in new governmental stimulus. And the last option is we could live with it, which, by the way, is kind of what we always do. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about this pay down issue. And to do that, we're going to look at the Great Depression itself. And you see here the red line is the, in, the nominal increase in private loans in the 10 years leading up to the Great Depression. The blue line is GDP. And you can see, as we would now expect, the blue line responds nicely to, a, to an increase in uh, private lending. The green line, by the way, is public debt to GDP during that period. It was entirely benign. It's entirely flat. Then you have 1929, and then you have something pretty interesting. Private debt declines by 25% in a period of about three and a half years. It's, it's unimaginable in a today's world. It's unimaginable that you would have a 25% decline in bank balances. And by the way, that's about $35 billion in 1930 dollars. Notice what happens to the blue line, which is GDP. It declines at almost exactly the same slope in almost exactly the same dollar amount. It's about $40 billion in 1930 dollars. We would argue that the pay down in debt is actually what caused the hypercontraction in the United States economy in the 1930s in a very intense three and a half year period. And notice the green line 
you're starting to have government spending programs, you're starting to have lower government tax receipts, is, is they're trying to be a stimulus, but it's dwarfed by the size of the decline uh, of, of private lending and of GDP. That's, by the way, about a 45% nominal decline uh, in GDP. And then we all know a few good things happened in, uh, in about 1933-34 and things started slowly to come back. Now, why did loans decline 25% in a three and a half year period? Well, one of the reasons was there was a run on bank deposits and if deposits leave, you have no choice but to call in loans. So that was obviously a big factor. But the mindset of the time governed it as well. Treasury Secretary Mellon said in a quote that probably half the people in this room know by heart, liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, weed out weak people, weed out weak banks. It was the mindset of the time. It was viewed as the cure. Instead, in our view, it was the cause of the hypercontraction. So, the single biggest lesson of the Great Depression for economists was to avoid major debt pay down, a liquidity crunch. Thus, in the 2000s, we again had runaway lending, but we did not have massive debt pay down after the crisis point. So instead of private debt contraction of 25% and unemployment of 25%, the amount of debt contract, private debt contraction after the Great Recession was 3%. And the amount of GDP contraction was 3%. And the unemployment level was 9%. Let's look at that. You see, in the 10-year period prior to the Great Recession, the exact same slope in terms of nominal increase in private loans, you can again see GDP responding favorably to that and you can again see that government debt, the green line, is a less relevant, more benign factor. Then you have the beginning of kind of a multi-stage crisis in 2007. But here you see the point I was making, which is private lending only contracted about 3%, GDP only contracted about 3%. And by the way, private loans are back up to the level they were nominally prior to the, to the crisis. We avoided the depression, but we have a new dilemma. A heavy overhang of personal and business debt, and with that, less capacity for consumers and businesses to lead us forward. The Eurozone crisis, we will touch on this, Steve will actually touch on this very briefly. The Eurozone crisis is the exact same kind of crisis you'll see in Spain in particular. Runaway lending happened in Japan prior to 1991. Again, the number, if you calculate it, is almost 40% in a 10-year period. And 22 years later, Japan's economy has barely grown. And debt to GDP is still above 150%. I'm not going to take you through this same model in the same detail, but you see the crisis point is the black line. You can see the red line in Japan in the 10 years prior to that at that exact same slope. The nice follow-on movement of the blue line GDP, the relatively smaller impact that government debt makes. But you see after this that private lending didn't decline at all for a period of over five years. And GDP at a point in which the stock market is declining almost 90%. Real estate values are declining almost 90%. GDP didn't decline because private lending didn't decline. Now that changed uh, starting in 97, 98, but that's another story. Let me turn it over to Steve Clemens at this point in time. I kind of like how you're working this machine here. I may not know how to do it. I just push this here. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, so what we have now uh, is we have invested quite a bit in grabbing other data sets from other nations in the world to sort of look at, at other countries. And here, there's a nice confusing graph uh, with lots of countries. We have United States, Japan, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain uh, looked at in terms of uh, debt and the rise of debt net of deposits. And what you see is um, substantial growth in, in debt in all of these countries. And here we have total debt to GDP of this, these same countries, and up here you see Brazil, or no, Japan is by far the highest, upwards of uh, 
375% of GDP when you look at total debt and you come down and you look at the United States, which is substantially high when you look at all forms of debt. So you look at private and government debt. <clears throat> and the available, we argue the available borrowing capacity uh, should be included when uh, measuring a nation's wealth entirely, which is, which is the, the net debt issue. And then in the Eurozone, when you look from 1980 to 2010, private debt to GDP uh, of Spain, so you've got a uh, massive increase here when you get into the 1990s in, in terms of Spain. So when you look at the performance we've seen uh, broadly in Europe today, which many of us have been watching with, uh, you know, uh, uh, on, a, on, a, on a cliff near, nearby a cliff, you've got Spain. Here we have France that's also moved up. Italy, Germany has been a very fiscally conservative uh, country, you can basically see it as well. <clears throat> Tina Silla and Charybdis, uh, you have the issue that Richard just outlined very well. You've got your policy options of either uh, trying to take a deleveraging strategy, which contracts GDP, as we saw in the uh, uh, 1930s, which really with, you know, squeezed down values, but basically took a lot of the bone and marrow out of the economy, or the opposite of, of trying to relever uh, in ways promoting growth, but increasing the structural precariousness of the economy, dampening future growth, which is what Richard and I um, worry about today. When you look at basically where we're at, we're back at 2007 levels of private sector debt. No one really talking much about this issue, but then you ask yourself the question of where is the spring in the step going to come from when you maintain such high levels of debt. We have um, another interesting observation in general that when you compare rates of global growth and, and look at percentage of uh, change in GDP and international dollars, if you look at the world, how do we how do we done this, Richard? We've done this with, go ahead. So the purple here, this first phase for the BRIC nations, this is 1950 to 1960. The red is 61 to 70, the, the 70s and 80s. As you look at the, at the general trend lines and what's happening, you, you basically see growth rates for the world declining over time. This, I would say, in the aggregate is the most interesting, where you were basically moving in, you know, this, in this decade period from 50 to 60 percent in a decade and coming down as we come in. So the global acquisition of high levels of debt actually is beginning to be seen in the, in the, uh, in the potential for global growth to happen. So the notion that this is sort of a ball and chain around growth is being reflected in the long-term uh, trends. Oh, and I haven't seen this data here. Here are the declines, the bricks. So we see global growth declining in all of these areas. So if you have different ways of decreasing high levels of debt, whatever, as Richard said, you could basically go through a pay down strategy causing economic contraction. You could get government debt under control, a must at some point. Of course, I live in DC and this is what we're struggling with right now, but it does create short term GDP pressure and does not address the private debt levels. Um, if you look at growth or inflation, this takes t 15 to 20 years and bumps up against the damping, dampening effect of debt on growth. Debt restructuring, uh, an obstacle of moral hazard and objections regarding wealth transfer. But as Richard pointed out a moment ago, a trillion in restructuring is better than a trillion in new stimulus. Part of this is, and we've been focusing and thinking a bit about the debt restructuring issue, is debt restructuring occurs in, in your business and financial sector all the time. But with the mortgage lending, uh, the, the, the private home loan mortgage areas, it ha has not happened to the degree with the portfolios that are being held by the financial industry today that we would argue would move the economy forward, take a lot of the burden off of uh, private households, give them an opportunity to contribute back to the economy without at the same time, and this is I think what comes in the issue of, uh, uh, which I feel is very important, adding great new debt obligations to the US government accounts. So what we're looking at is what's more efficacious, basically uh, finding a debt forgiving or debt workout strategy that does not add to, to the government debt load but increases economic uh, uh, activity in, in the shorter term, we, we find this fairly compelling. Uh, and uh, Richard says, live with it, or uh, don't we always? Essentially, we, we finalize and come in. This is our final slide, it is. provocations. So the questions and provocation we, we put forward is global leverage is increasing unabated, and how and when will that trend end? That's one of the core questions we have. If you look over the hundreds of years of data sets 
for some of the countries we've been looking at. And we're going to be putting all of this online. It's interestingly not out there. The private debt levels are not easily accessible, not easily co co you know, comparable. And, and so we are looking forward to feedback when we put this bout out, out on the, uh, the net, to basically to solicit lots of other responses. But when you look at the, the history of growth in economies, debt levels globally are growing. We see global growth slowing in part because of it, and we look at it as a problem that's not received the sort of attention we feel is important. In the context of perpetually increasing leverage, all bank lending criteria is perpetually becoming obsolete. Global GDP growth has been decelerating in the last few decades. What will cause that trend to reverse? And lastly, how can we delever without contracting uh, GDP? Those, that is uh, essentially where we're at. I'd just like to add just a you know, couple of concluding comments, particularly in the area where Richard and I are writing. We just did, what was the local TV show today? Marty Moskowitz. Ma Marty Moskowitz. We did an hour on this. And in talking a little bit about this question of how do you basically get more bang for the buck, if you will, in a U.S. economy and looking at this. And I, and I know many of you come from the financial sector and the banking sector. But to ask this fundamental question of what are the inhibitors to really getting the, uh, the mortgages and the loan portfolios re worked out with, with the loan holder. That if there was some way to work that in a way, what we've been looking at, I'd just like to get some feedback and response, is a question of what regulators could do if they were to basically create a longer runway for a longer period of write-off of those assets. Because obviously, when you're talking about two and a half trillion dollars of loans that were made above trend line, and you look at the asset base of the you know American banking and financial sector, you're looking at a real you're you're looking at a situation where you can't match it. What seems to be missing. Is, is the public interest dimension where regulators could provide a pathway for those assets to be written down to value over a longer period of time so that it didn't basically uh, sabotage and submarine the, uh, the reserves of these banks and financial institutions. That's one of the things that we're looking at because that would then enable you to basically give uh, uh, essentially a debt, what we call a debt jubilee or a debt uh, forgiveness to those holding the loans at some level, but at the same time give that bank and financial institution a way out to basically make those loans, mark them to value and to, and to um, get back to, to health. And at the same time you get the public interest side where you get a you know, healthier growth return, much like we saw in the uh, 1940s and 50s when you saw you know, a much more sustainable uh, element of growth. So we're trying to answer that question of how to deal with these two dimensions of writing down debt but not cutting, out, cutting down the GDP, but at the same time hiding the debt in the system, which is what we argue is happening today, where fundamentally it's very hard to imagine uh, a robust growth scenario with the amount of debt that's still basically packed in the U.S. economy given how highly leveraged it is. So thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> um, I was curious about the data sets. Are they going to be on your website? Or? They are. We yeah. have a website called debt-economics.org. And all this data going back historically, as far as we could get it, mm -hmm. on the G20, the top 20 economies in the world, is out there right now. Maybe, I don't know where Ben is. We've got Ben. Maybe we might want to talk about providing a link or something for that, get, get some more eyeballs on that, that page. Um, as I said in the beginning, uh, I thought you enjoy some provocative and interesting remarks, and a lot of hard work has gone into this, obviously. Uh, but we're very pleased to have two well-known economists that we've uh, we've uh, uh, had review these this information, the paper, and uh, and ask them to to make some uh, uh, comments on on the uh, on the paper and the remarks that were heard. So we'll start with Tony Santomero, if we would, good, and follow Paul. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's an interesting, provocative paper. Uh, it, uh, it ends a, a little bit more strongly, I would argue, than Steve had it end. It gets to the point of the last slide, and it says, and therefore, we need to forgive debt in order for the economy uh, to proceed from here, rather than having a decade or two of kind of a Japanese stagnation, mm -hmm. and and it's it, it's in this um, spirit that I'm going to have my comments relating to their work, um, and, and the, the, so the story basically is private debt above some number, the number that, the, that they seem to think is the right one's 150, and I'm not going to argue about 130, 160, some high number like that. Uh, leads to a crisis, 
and uh, the net result is it's unsustainable unless we somehow unwind this debt. Um, now, I'm, I, I'm a little concerned about private debt versus consumer debt because a lot of the pressure on, on uh, aggregate demand forces is driven by consumer debt. And the consumer debt uh, in the, the 20s and 30s rather than in the, the 2000s is a different picture. But I'll accept the notion that private debt is a proxy for um, some combination of uh, business and, and consumer debt. And given the reality that uh, nobody's got a, a data set that looks anything like this, I can't complain about the, the nature of the data when the alternative is not having data. So, so I'm, I'm supportive of their effort. Um, um, when I thought about this um, discussion and this, this whole argument, I, I kind of had a feeling that I was missing something. I, you, know, you ever see one of these movies where you're in the middle of a, the, the movie when it starts and you're trying to unravel sort of what went on before this so that I can understand why this is happening. Um, and, and I think my, my, my puzzle with um, where they're going with this is that they're kind of in the middle of it. Uh, the, the, and they're in the middle of it in the sense that they're spending time on the, the debt quantity relative to GDP without sort of telling a story about how do we get debt and how did the debt accumulate so rapidly in the slides as they, they describe them. So uh, being an old, uh, old academic, I sat back and I said, all right, so, so let me build the world that we all, I think, agree on about how the, the macroeconomy works and try to get us to the point that they start, that is to say the point of debt overhang. Um, so, so what does my world look like? And, uh, my, my days of walking up to the blackboard and writing down a model, I could have done it here. I, as a matter of fact, asked my colleagues whether or not they were going to use overheads, otherwise I'd have to use a whole bunch of, a bunch of math. You, you, you've, you're spared this. But let, let's walk through it. What we're really concerned about is the ability of consumption to lead to growth expansion. What do we know about consumption? Indeed, what do we know about all over, uh, aggregate demand? Aggregate demand is consumption and investment and government spending. Consumption is a, a majority of that number. What drives consumption? In general, the answer is income and wealth. But we're sophisticated enough to know that it's not a single period lockstep relationship for everybody. And in fact, if, if the markets were perfect, and I'm not suggesting that they are, we would look at a life cycle of income and the initial wealth position and we'd figure out what our consumption path would be over time. Now, now, not everybody can live in that world because, for example, in early stages you need to borrow money because your income isn't as high as it is in, at, at later parts of your life. And there are some people that are constrained. And there's a bunch of academic work uh, that says something like 20 or 30 percent of the population is actually constrained by how much money they are making in terms of how much they can spend, whereas a, a, a large percentage will in fact be able to either accumulate debt or reduce debt. So, so the, the general characterization with the caveat that there are liquidity constraints in the system is that people are consuming based upon their income and their wealth over some horizon. And during periods of growth, and take the last 20 years prior to 2007, uh, that story basically is that wealth was accumulating because of housing prices rising mm -hmm. and income was accumulating because there was this expectation that we were in a boom time. You know, the, every 20 years academics have a, a course in the, in the economics department, is the business cycle over? Why? Because things have been growing for 10 or 12 years. So people start predicting an expansion of income which will allow me to spend now in anticipation of <coughs> higher income later. On the, on the housing side, Bob Schiller showed in a number of pieces over the previous decade the fact that housing prices were rising much more rapidly than real income and indeed much more rapidly than any historical time series up until 2007. So the individuals, essentially, this representative guy who's consuming or gal, 
is, is basically saying, I'm going to consume based upon what I expect to make in the long run, and things are looking good, and what I expect in wealth, and part of my wealth is the stock market, and part of my wealth is my housing stock, which is improving in value. And, and you, we've all lived through the fact that I can take equity out of my house by virtue of the fact that my house went up so much in value, I can get a second mortgage is associated with that and the like. So my, my point is that this story of the representative agent is one in which debt is the result of this life cycle consumption pattern, subject to the availability of the financial markets providing you debt in order to make this possible. Now, now how does that work? Well, with, in, in truth, what happens is our growth rate in debt is going to be the result of a few things. First of all, the underlying valuation of the assets that we're trying to leverage. And again, I make reference to the housing market. And if you go before the dot-com bubble, I would have said the stock market, which everyone thought they could leverage up because their 401ks were rising so quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and were they illusory? That's the phrase that was used. I don't think so. They weren't sustainable. Nobody sort of said, well, it's high now, but it's going down later. They said, it's high now, isn't that great? And they may have made the mistake of projecting forward, but they didn't sort of say, well, the natural price for the Dow was actually 10,000, it's 13 now, so I'm going to presume my wealth is 10,000. They said it's 13, I don't know what's going to happen from here, it's, times are pretty good. Okay? Now, so, so the first thing that determines your ability to accumulate this debt is in fact the underlying assets that you're trying to lever up. Um, the ability to pay, which is this dynamic of, of, of income growth. The, the, the financial condition of the financial sector, and that's everything from deregulation, constraints on lending, availability of credit, and the scale of the financial sector itself, its ability to sustain this, this debt. All right, so there are lots of countries in the rest of the world slot where there is no housing structure to have house mortgages accumulate rapidly. And there are other countries where there is a primitive housing stock um, financing mechanism because either regulation or desire of the population has restricted the ability to do that. So, so we get into this problem, if you will, essentially because the, the private sector is spending more than they're making in income, and the difference is the debt that they're accumulating. And you, you could say you have to go through all of that to say the last sentence. Well, I think it is important to recognize that debt didn't show up at my door. It went into debt. I went into debt by virtue of the fact that I had this grand plan, and number one, a recession came, and number two, the housing, the asset values declined, and I found myself in a position where the debt relative to my global wealth somehow defined is a lot larger than I expected it to be. So, so then you say, okay, what do we do about that? And as was pointed out, there are only a few answers. One answer is, I've got too much debt, I better spend less so I can save more and erode down my credit card or my second line of credit, private equity. Uh, I'm sorry, my, my second mortgage as a mechanism of getting essentially less debt. The second is, I can des decide to forgive in some private sector combination of ways. That is to say, those that hold the debt can forgive some of that debt. I got that. And that's, that's the direction they're going. But I don't get how that works. Who's got it? And how do they feel about this? All right? And we'll go back to that point. And the third solution is have essentially the government assume that debt. And do so by essentially raising taxes over some horizon as a way of paying back what is essentially a reduction in taxes today. Mm -hmm. 
they say to me, you don't have to pay that back. I will assume it. That's like a negative tax to me. So if we do the first one, allow the private sector to consume less and save more, the economy goes into recession, and that's what we have observed. And the basic proposition here is we can't allow this to happen over the longer run because the erosion of spending power will lead to consumption declines and aggregate demand too low, and we're going to get low growth rates like we've had, like Japan has evidenced, and the like. Okay, so that, so that means that we've got to think about the other two. Let me jump to the third for a moment. Declining taxes, essentially allowing the government to assume some of this debt, all right, as a way of freeing the private sector. In, in some very real sense, this is a stimulus package. And it's most recently been articulated as it relates to student loans. You know, we got a trillion dollars of student loans. These kids will never get out from under those student loans. And you sort of say, now, wait a second, you got this debt. What's the, the accounting of that? Well, the government debt goes up because the consumer is transferred to the government, and the government essentially doesn't get the revenue. All right? Now, governments don't like doing that, so they sort of look around and say, all right, who else can we get to write down some of this debt? And, and the obvious answer is, well, let's look at the private sector. So then the question becomes, who pays for the reduction in debt? And as in a macroeconomic balance sheet sense, how does that net? If, he, if I have a debt with him and he forgives it, I'm richer, he's poorer. All right, and, and if you've heard anybody on Social Security these days of moderate to low, moderate income, they'll tell you they are paying for the boom because interest rates decline, so their flow of income from their wealth has gone down. And now we're going to turn to them and say, I got a deal for you. We're going to wipe out half of those savings because these guys have too much debt. Not a very attractive solution to the problem from the point of view of the senior citizen, but a pretty good solution, oh, I think it's called strategic default, from the point of view of those that have high debt levels. So, so the, the point I'm making here is I want you to look at the incidence of the cost that balances the macroeconomic decline. Now, if we could get Bono to come in and write a check for a trillion dollars, that is to say from outside the system, bring in wealth to reduce debt, then there's no question. Consumption would rise, and the economy would grow, right? and, and everything would be fine. But if that's not the world we live in, then the question is, who pays the piper for the debt reduction? And there, there are only a few answers. Right? Number one, they're the wealth holders that hold the assets. A more flamboyant, flamboyant way might be the 401k that holds the Fannie Mae debt that is, in fact, supporting mortgages that are now underwater. Number two, the banks that directly write this stuff down. I've already talked about the first one. How about that solution? Well, we basically say, we're going to take your assets down, and you say, okay, accounting, the capital of the banking system. Now, we've sort of done that already with the recapitalization of the banks and the repayment of the TARP money. The banks essentially diluted their existing shareholders, borrowed money as a way, uh, excuse me, re, uh, raised money as equity and recapitalized themselves. So they would view themselves as saying, well, we've already played that game. We've already lost money on this debt. And in truth, they're not big enough even to do that. And every dollar that you take from their capital has a multiplier effect on the availability of credit, which isn't a sustainable way of getting out of a housing crisis. So, so we are left with a problem of who gets it? Who gets the hit associated with the debt? 
But there's also another problem. Who gets the money once we figured out whose money to take? All right, and, and that problem isn't any easier. We've talked about that problem before. I mean, that's the problem that says, we had a contract, you can't abide by the contract, you are going to not pay the contract this time and maybe next time. And credit spreads go up and the economy grows less rapidly because losses rise permanently in the system. Oh, we call that moral hazard. All right? And there are higher losses, they get built into the price, and contracts become less enforceable as they have been over the last several years as it relates to the housing market. All right? Um, and, and there is also a lower return for all those that are in the intermediary business, which in turn means less capital that can be leveraged for the expansion. So, so there are some real issues about who gets it. And the other one, which is the, the, the hot topic, the hot word of our, our, of our year, fairness. We, we want to forgive those thing, those loans that people can't pay we don't want to forgive those loans that people are paying. So if I'm paying my mortgage and you're not paying yours, then you're better off in this deal than I am, and I'm not sure that's fair. So the mechanics of who pays and the mechanics of who gains in the forgiveness are in very important attributes of resolving this problem. And the future implication of the debt reduction is a very important part as well. Going back to the Bono example, if you listen to the global markets, they'd say, look, we're going to forgive debt for a sovereign so that they are not crushed by that debt are we going to be able to get them to pay back the next round of debt? And will we allow them to borrow going forward, as is evidence in a number of countries in the world at the moment? So where do I, where do I come down on all of this? Uh, my, my answer is the expansion was overdone, I think the data will tell you, by overconsumption and most notably overconsumption of, in the housing sector. We now have a, a recession that is associated with the reality of that fact. Debt is a huge burden on the structure and it's very difficult to figure out how to undo it. So I have more questions than I have answers, all right, in terms of, so how do I do that? And I guess that's the next set of slides you guys are going to come with at the next conference. Mm -hmm. Or maybe my next commentator will pay, take up some of that issue. Uh, I wish it were easier to do, but saying, you know, the real problem is we spend too much. So we're going to forgive the debt of spending too much so you can spend some more is a story that I somehow remember my son telling me when he was an undergraduate. All right. I hit my credit card, pay it off so I can keep spending. And the only difference here is we turn around and say, and we need to keep spending in order to get aggregate demand to be growing again. So there is a noble reason why my son should be spending more money on his credit card. I don't know. I, I, I just can't get there from here. And with that, let me stop. <laughs> Echo what Tony said about asking the right questions. And I would echo squared the notion that the best way to start answering questions is to actually know what's going on. And you guys have been developing a very robust set of data so is that when we answer the questions, we try to answer them from facts as opposed to theology. And so much of the answers in the political sphere, which you know so very well, is all about theology. And after a while, you have to have facts. And facts are data. And I commend you intensely for that. 
your presentation does leave a great deal of begging for answers. So I will echo Tony on that. Is yes, we have an intense problem here. How did we get into the problem? There's been a great deal of work on that with a great overlay of morality, I think, and a great deal of theology. But there hasn't been, in public discourse, a lot of discussions of just pragmatically how do we get out of this mess. And I would certainly like to think in the years ahead that the economics profession, the business profession, and the political profession doesn't choose the option of simply living with it, but actually gets down to the pragmatic um, difficulty of making hard choices about a lot of different public policy options. So I want to echo what Tony had to say there and also uh, commend you uh, for the work and I look forward to version number two, three, four, and five. I've been doing a lot of research myself that is a continuing series dealing in parallel uh, sort of work on macro policy. But I want to take a diversion here for a second and think of another impractical problem that we have in society that's crying out for not only the right questions, the right data, but innovative solutions. And this comes about totally independent of what I did for 30 years of my career, which the last decade was a partner at PIMCO, one of the things that I've been involved in, I've been involved in a lot of things since I retired two years ago. Uh, the GIC, obviously, uh, things I do with the Morgan Le Fay Foundation, but also I do uh, angel investing in a variety of interesting small startup companies. So I actually am creating some jobs from time to time, which is kind of cool. You've done that a number of times, Richard. It's There's sense of satisfaction of having people on your payroll. There's also a incredible sense of fear having people on your payroll. <laughs> There's nothing like teaching you business and having to meet a payroll. So the joy of having created a job goes with the liability of having to meet the payroll. And I've done that in, in a number of different fields. But one of the companies that I am involved in, I'm actually the chairman of the company, is a company called Recovery Media, which was founded a couple years ago. Uh, and its dominant um, business is an online magazine and resource uh, base uh, devoted to addiction and recovery. Trying to deal with that scourge in society, which is, has a great deal of stigma associated with it, uh, and also a great deal of misunderstanding as well. Uh, and what we're trying to do with this business venture and magazine uh, is actually bring transparency, which is called data, uh, and ask the right questions, because the central fact of the matter is, is notwithstanding the 40-year, goes back to Nixon, I suppose, and Reagan, the 40-year war, war on drugs, we have not won the war of anything in our society. We have gone backwards. And we've spent an absolute fortune as a nation in that war, and we've lost. And I think in many respects, that's about addiction to drugs and alcohol and so forth. And what you're talking about is addiction to private sector debt. We as an economy, and I think the data come out very clear, Richard, we as an economy don't really have a joyous time unless we're seriously imbibing private sector debt at a faster clip than GDP. I think that's a critical piece of data that you lay out. Not just imbibing debt, but at a faster pace than the debt is creating GDP or income. Ergo, as you point out, the constraint that it's a hell of a good party, but inevitably the party ends in tears. And 
since we are a going concern as society, we can't say, okay, the party's just over. Live with it. We're not going to have party times anymore. Obviously, Japan has done that up until the last six months. And then Japan has a new bartender in chief uh, <laughs> right now. Took 20 years for them to find a new bartender in chief, but they found one. And you're actually seeing the manifestations in um, the marketplace, particularly the yen and the uh, equity market uh, in um, in Japan, but you're also seeing the rest of the world say, hold on, hold, hold, hold on, you guys in Japan can't be doing this by yourself because that's going to set off a currency war. So actually Japan has finally done what the Western world has told them to do for the last 20 years, and now the Western world is saying, hold on, fellas, we didn't think you'd ever actually contemplate it doing this and you have this Abe guy serving doubles at happy hour prices. I'm not sure about this anymore. I'm not sure about this anymore. Uh, so I, I get, I come at this from, since I don't have to manage other people's money for a living anymore, a little bit more philosophical approach. And so what you're talking about with respect to the debt has a great deal of parallels, I think, in the whole mm -hmm. field of addiction and recovery and the answer to me is in both fields data analysis identification of the problem itself you really can't get anywhere without having a clear-headed view of what the problem is and I think on the debt side of things, as well as in the substance side of things, too often the discussion starts with morality. Is you took too much debt out. You were immoral. You deserve to be living under a bridge. You really didn't deserve to own a house. You don't even deserve to live in a rental house. You need to go to the modern day equivalent of debtor's prison. We don't say that, but as a practical matter, a great deal of our society has been put into the moral equivalent of a debtor's prison. And that has profound implications for spending. People in debtor's prisons aren't really allowed to spend very much. Or you could call it the Betty Ford Center for Balance Sheet Rehabilitation. <laughs> You're in the Betty Ford Center for Balance Sheet You're supposed to be delivering here, son. You're not supposed to be borrowing more money. And at the individual level, you say, yes, that's fitting and proper and moral. But you aggregate it up into society, and you get an economy where you don't have sufficient aggregate demand, which is what Tony was talking about. And in a democratic society, we cannot go forever with a headwind of deleveraging an inadequate adequate demand. Because that itself, while it may be just at the individual level, leads to social injustice at the macro level. Not the least of which is an ever-widening income inequality in our country. So what you guys are researching is not just a green eye shade exercise. It is a green shade exercise in how do we deal with it, but for me the issue is if we don't deal with it, then we end up with a society that doesn't fit with our fundamental values. And one of our fundamental values is at least equality of opportunity. And our society can't afford to fund our values without adequate growth. 
And you can't get adequate growth as long as you have a good segment of the society checked into the Betty Ford Center for Balance Sheet Rehabilitation while you simultaneously have fat cat bankers <laughs> looking like they got off scot free. Am I sounding like the election of the last year? Mm -hmm. Yes, not because I'm trying to be provocative, but simply bring home the fact that what these guys are researching is real. It's the income inequality issues are real. They are real. And it tears at the very fabric of our overall society. I have some ideas on solutions. I've written a great deal about them. I'm not going to tout my own papers in this space. What I really want to do in my allotted few minutes today, besides commending you on the work, is to stress how much this is essential work in dealing with much bigger issues. And the bigger issues are what are near and dear to my heart. I can get out in the trenches with the best of them as a green eye shade and come up with all sorts of ways of dealing with this issue. But what is acceptable to society, what's doable in society is usually important. Now, I'll end with just a few additional parallels as I think back to the 40-year war that the country has fought and lost with respect to the whole issue of the war on drugs. And I'm seeing a transformation finally in that area. I don't think that the company I'm affiliated with has anything to do with that per se. We comment on it and so forth. But actually, I learn a lot by living in California. And California, for good or for bad, has been operating, particularly in the last decade, with the model of criminalizing the addicted. Because that's the just and moral thing to do. So we catch young people, more and more, they're getting younger and younger in California. I assume it's the case around the country as well. Doing bad things associated with their substance abuse. We say they have the disease of addiction. And then we also pass something called three strikes and you're out. So therefore, we criminalize those with a disease and lock them away for 20 years. And you see a lot of, you know, chest beating that we're being tough. We're being tough. We're being tough. And in a direct sort of sense, that probably is the case. But at the society level, not at the individual case, at society level, that's not enlightened policy. You got a 20 year old kid, he's done bad things and you lock him away for 20 years. The taxpayer's got to pay for him to be in prison for guess how long? 20 years. That's a very, very expensive proposition. The person doesn't go away. He becomes a bigger burden on society for the simple reason you've got to feed him, clothe him, and give him medical care for the next 20 years to extract justice for the fact that he got high and knocked off a 7-Eleven. I'm not condoning getting high and knocking off a 7-Eleven. I'm not advocating that whatsoever. That is bad. But for society at large, locking that kid up for 20 years and giving him a cotton three squares a day is not particularly cost efficient. 
We also have the collateral damage. That, that's a 20-year education in higher crimes because that's what the prison system is. And we in California just finally backed away marginally from the three strikes and you're out rule. Everyone familiar with three strikes and you're out in California? Three felonies and it's 20 years in jail. And we just modified it at the margin. So as your third strike can't be just a technical felony, it has to be a felony that involves armed robbery or something of that nature. If it's just a technical felony such as probation violation on your second felony, <laughs> and that's a technical felony that you violated probation on your second felony, that is not an automatic three uh, strikes and you're out. And you have a lot of people uh, against that, but we passed it at the referendum level, which is important because California leads by referendum. Uh, so we, that's the beginning of trying to look at it in a somewhat more enlightened perspective. But it is very much only a beginning. It's an enormously expensive for society to enduringly criminalize those with the disease of alcoholism and addiction. Not saying kind things about that disease whatsoever, but it's an enormous drain on society to criminalize it. And what we're doing with those who shouldn't have borrowed money, but did, and we've locked them into purgatory forever, is very similar. And continuing the parallel, Society can't tolerate knocking off 7-Elevens while doing drugs. Society, however, can deal directly with the disease of drug addiction. And if we can fix that, then maybe we don't have to worry about you knocking off 7-Elevens anymore. And maybe you will get a job. And maybe you will support your family. And maybe in a pipe dream you will become a taxpayer. That's a vision that we're starting to see at the very beginning is bad behavior needs to be punished. But let's not punish ourselves in an egregious, stupid way trying to extract a pound of flesh out of where there is no pound. And I think the same thing is the case with respect to debtors. There has to be consequences but if the, of excessive debt. But if the consequence is 20 years for America, like 20 years for Japan, that has got to be a terrible self-inflicted consequence. So I think in both fields, both fields, the one that I mentioned that I'm involved with with my company, we need to have innovative thinking based upon facts. If I'm going to deal with the fact that you are have the disease, then maybe I should have evidence-based treatment programs for the disease. So therefore, there's no excuse for not getting the right answer to treatment. Even as you say, 20 years of criminalization probably is not the, the best idea. And there is no solution to coming up with innovative ways to deal with the debt, which requires out of the box, unorthodox thinking frequently. But it's absolutely critical, I think, that we do that. So let me conclude there by simply saying I don't think our society should have a large segment that is either in jail for the disease of alcoholism or in the Betty Ford Center for Balance Sheet Rehabilitation because they did what everyone told them to do which is to buy a house with a low down payment. That's all they did was buy a house with a low down payment. Was it stupid? Yeah. They did it. But we do not want to incarcerate or put into debtors' prisons a good chunk of our population to make us feel good and moral and righteous 
because doing so is quite frankly expensive and is a massive headwind to economic growth. I think you guys have got your finger directly on a key issue for us breaking out of this purgatory of enduring stagnation in our economy. And I thank you for your effort. Thanks thank very you. much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Paul. Um, before we move on, um, I want you to join me in, in thanking our, our speakers, Tony and Paul. Why don't you guys come up here and we can get into a more yeah. of a op open discussion. But um, I thought it was a very interesting interlude and we'll proceed with some, some Q&A and discussion. But let's... Um, and I don't know whether uh, uh, you guys have any thoughts or comments that you want to make uh, based upon... Just a couple. Yeah. First of all, I tell you, any, every time I, I'm with both Tony and Paul, I'm more impressed with the, their acumen and their knowledge of, of this discipline, and I'm really grateful that y'all are part of this today. D Tony's comments were right on. I mean, there was nothing about what Tony said that I would disagree with. Going down this path is fraught with potentially insurmountable obstacles. But I kind of approached it from a different way. Take debt restructuring off the table. Say that it's not a feasible solution, because it's probably not politically or economically. And then try to solve the problem another way. And I'll sit down with you, with my little spreadsheet and your little spreadsheet, try to, try to get out of this problem with growth. Try to get out of this problem with inflation. Try any other means you want, and I'll sit there in front of the spreadsheet with you, and you're talking about a couple of generation issue. And that's what keeps bringing me back to this thing that is fraught with problems, but mathematically works. And Tony, who pays for it? There's only one, you know, it, it, at the moment of crisis, I think the shareholders and bondholders could have taken a bigger piece of it. Others might disagree. Wouldn't have been the whole piece. So to me, who pays for it is the easiest solution, which is you spread it out over 20 or 30 years into the future. You know, and at several points along the way in my banking career, regulators have intervened in an ad hoc way and, and said, you know, if this, the first savings and loan crisis when they created this kind of negative amortization kind of a thing, uh, the Volcker with the Latin American debt crisis, created kind of by fiat this, take the charge, but don't hit your capital account. Spread it over X years. And, and that, that just means we've borrowed a little bit out of the future in a hopefully less painful way. Yeah. It's fraught with problems. One other thing that I would say, the biggest surprise to me in all of this, and both of you guys made this comment, and you are both exactly right, but the biggest surprise of my analytical career, and I've been a banker for a long time, is that debt grows faster than GDP. Private debt grows faster than GDP. Public debt grows faster than GDP. Inevitably, through a period of time, and I think there have been two great cycles in the industrial age in America, 1820 to 1929, and then 1945 to 2007. Those are the two great cycles in American economic history. As Paul said, the party had to end. There has to be a day of reckoning if debt is accumulating faster than economic wealth. Thank you. Steve? Uh, I would simply say thanks to both of you. I'm fascinated by, by the comments. And Tony, while I think, well, one, I do think there's interesting questions and, and corollaries with um, addiction, which we can talk about perhaps later. But Tony, when you get down to the question of who pays and some of these moral questions, I think this particular financial crisis lends an opportunity to, to answer that in ways that you couldn't normally do in, in, in any many other uh, economic crises. In the particular case of this, you had institutions that were bailed out and management held in place, and you already basically crossed certain moral lines that enables you to look at other parts of that equation. Now, I'm actually not trying to look at this morally. I'm trying to look at this pragmatically, and basically so you've got 160 uh, percent uh, private debt to DG, G, uh, GDP ratio that if, if that remains a ball and chain around the American economy, then a lot of the, the debates we have about growth and whatnot are, are just, just for naught. And so the question is, as Richard says, how do you basically you know, come back to this area? And I would assume 
that when you look at the question of who pays, and you're a banker and I'm not, but fundamentally if you mark the value, those, those banks and financial institutions already have internally recognized those losses. And they're already operating on the basis that many of those things are losses. What's not being delivered is the workout with the loan holder. And I think that is, that is the step that we're trying to sort of look at. How can you animate that? Because it would be a healthier move, perhaps. Now, I'm just assuming, because I sit next to sort of one of the kings of the credit card business, that that is accurate, that large, many of these institutions have already internally marked these assets to value. It's something we can discuss. But so what we're trying to do is essentially clear the market in a way that allows folks to grow again and not grow recklessly because we had a particular moment of bizarre structural corruption in my view that seduced and created behaviors that drew in uh, those, those people that took loans and because of the systemic shock in the economy the job losses and the economic losses were so much more profound because of this, and that's what, when, you know, one of the other graphs that we didn't show, which I think is really interesting, it's good to remind people, particularly as I go back to Washington tonight, I'm going to hear the President's State of the Union address, be in Congress, and you're going to see all these people, you know, up in arms about government debt levels. In almost all of these cases where you've had significant financial crises, in the European states or others, you look at the public sector debt, it's flat. It's a non-event. And it isn't until the private sector event happens that you have these massive surges in the government debt. And then we don't look at the private sector debt issue. We look at the, the debate over that. And why do we do that? I was asked on the radio show. We do it because now your stakeholders in that are all taxpayers. So there are a lot of other people that are now connected and feel as if they're being screwed to some degree because of the, uh, this private sector debt event. So, you know, to a certain degree, I, I agree with all of your framing on the que you know, questions of who pays, but I believe particularly these are solvable. I don't think they're unsolvable. I do think that there are things that if you can do and you can make the pragmatic goal, clearing the markets, you can, we make judgments every day about how long all of you are going to work and to what age. We make, you know, judgments on, you know, what your health care, we, we make these lines all the time. They're fundamentally political decisions. But if the goal is basically cleaning up the market, moving Americans back to a place where they're not living in a two or three speed economy and you can get back so that you know hard work earns a return and you basically get healthy growth again that might be a very worthy uh, you know public goal that, that that could animate this further well said well said um, I promised you in the beginning that we would open this up and I hope you I wasn't seeing anybody taking notes and getting questions but hopefully you'll have a few questions here sir How much debt there is? How much debt there is, whether it's public or private. Mm. Uh, you know, it's over 100 trillion. And so for an economy that has tax receipts of a couple of trillion, and when we sit down and listen to a president of Congress that wants to play around with a little, uh, they call them cuts, $4 trillion over 10 years is chunk. And so I, I don't agree with it he just this law fix itself? I mean, I think it's plain as day that the time is coming. And when it comes, it'll be ugly. You know, well, did, I'm not arguing it'll fix itself. 29, yeah. wherever we are in this yeah. next cycle, um, is, is indomitable. Right. I, I, I mean, I, it's not. I just don't see, you know, with all your brain power, you don't see that. I mean, we can deal with all the stuff, but it is plain as day. You can't pay back debt, public and private, over $100 trillion to $2 trillion dollars in tax receipts, plus, you know, the, the widening, if you want to call it, barbell society. And I realize that some people talk about the rest of the world with the emerging market for that. Don't buy it. Don't buy it. I'm not sure I heard a question well, there, but yeah. if anybody well, let's has just take a few comments. questions and then we'll yeah. respond. Okay, okay what's well, got a few questions, comments? Yes, please. Uh, a couple questions. More so, um, kind of asking about how much housing debt is considered private debt. And then secondly, um, I was involved in a lot of the home affordable market program in 2009. And then secondarily, they came out with um, the home affordable refinance program where they tried to incentivize the banks to be a little bit more, take a little bit on the credit, um, the borrowed perspective. Uh, of, of the $25 trillion at the end of 2011, less than $10 trillion was mortgage debt. 
It's about 50-50, 50% business debt, 50% consumer debt, most consumer debt, 80% of consumer debt is mortgage debt. The programs you refer to, I think the, the numbers are there's 55 million mortgages in the U.S. Right. Estimates which are inexact is maybe 10 or 11 million of those are underwater. Mm -hmm. The programs you talk about, I really think never reach more than a few hundred thousand borrowers. Been, yeah, that's correct. Sir? I'll attempt to answer the gentleman's question about the, the debt and this leads into another question. Uh, or the Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve of St. Louis publishes total credit market debt to their, their chart. Uh, and it grew from $1 trillion in the uh, mid-60s to about $55 trillion in total credit market debt in 08. Uh, and that's where it faltered for the first time in those 40 or 50 years. And now we're at $56 trillion in total credit market debt. And my, my question is, um, there are some economists um, out there that believe that we cannot, and I've heard this uh, talked about here, that we cannot slow or retard that growth of total credit market debt because uh, we're beyond the point uh, where it would be very difficult for the economy to recover. And there's some that, that believe that we need a very targeted, and I don't know if I agree with this, that's why I'm going to ask the experts here, that we need a very targeted government spending program uh, to the tune of this particular economist that $4 trillion spent over uh, the next several years in very specific industries, biotech, solar, what have you, that that would uh, make us dominant leaders in these particular areas because we as the government can print money where we want to, print $4 trillion, and that would uh, generate the growth and allow us to finally get out of this, uh, this slow growth environment. I'm, not a, I'm still not sure I agree with that, but I'd like to hear any comments on, uh, uh, on that particular issue. Who wants to start? Well, I, I, I mean, Paul may have, may, Paul may say, you know, print more. Uh, I tend to be in, in the area that think that national investments that create recurring returns for an economy uh, uh, beyond their investment are very important and that, you know, I come out of that environment and it, it tends to be less there when you look at if you basically, for every dollar deployed, um, you get different kinds of multipliers. And so you look, we, this was one of the discussions in the <coughs> Obama administration with the TARP, you know, why were they so slow on certain kinds of infrastructure things? Truth be told, Jared Bernstein, who was President Biden's economic advisor, essentially wrote the so-called jobs and infrastructure plan that Obama ran on. And I kept saying, why didn't you do it three years ago? Because there you would have had, you would not have been in the toxic political environment and just sort of politicking with it. You would have been looking at the implementation of these kinds of things. So I am completely unfamiliar with this question of somebody spending $4 trillion as a way to basically drive credit market stuff. I am familiar with people, Bernard Schwartz and others, who've been trying to move uh, the White House and their followers in Congress, Bernard's uh, very big in the Democratic Party, to take more seriously these long-term structural investments across this, a lot of these kind of next economy uh, sectors. But it doesn't change from the fundamental equation that there have to essentially returns. There are lots of moral hazard questions in, in, in these kinds of things, and you've got public debates that are legitimate debates on the difference between, I had, you know, dinner the other day with the head of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the military. They do technology targeting. They put a lot of money in it. Their basically job is to be industrial policy to develop the next smart, you know, technology gadgets, the next internets, if you will. Um, but that is not the way the federal government operates. The private sector is the private sector, and that's where you get most innovation. You know, tonight, uh, uh, Tim Cook, who's the CEO of Apple, will be sitting with Michelle Obama listening to State of the Union address. And, and so this will be, you know, basically homage to what happens in the private sector. Make, there may be government, but government role in this stuff is really peripheral, if relevant at all. I think that we need to have much smarter debates. And what I worry about on, uh, with the data that we're looking at is if you look in the aggregate at the debt load that the country is carrying, it's very, very hard to figure out what your growth strategies are, even if you are able to make some of these investments in certain areas. And what we're just saying is we've got to have some aspect of cleaning those books. In fact, it's more consequential to do that than it is to uh, maybe slash the government. I'm not against reducing government spending or getting a more fiscally responsible plan in place, but the multiplier of that for the U.S. economy is much smaller than the kinds of things we're talking about. And if you are able to successfully figure out the uh, who pays and who wins, and these, if you're able to navigate that in a constructive way that you've got a majority of support for, 
you simultaneously get much more economic activity in the economy and you haven't added to the national debt load. All you've done is try to make the, the market more rational and, and to move you know, in ways that I think it wants to, but it's just blocked. Is that fair, Richard? Paul? Let me come at your question by uttering two words, public investment, talking about <clears throat> public investment. In the last 10 to 20 years, part of the political climate, the celebration of capitalism and Wall Street before the crash, public investment had become a oxymoron. It was all about the private sector. Remember, as recently as the second term of President Clinton, mm -hmm. we were running a surplus. And Tony's old boss, Alan, was asked, what's the best use of the surplus? And the answer was to pay down the public debt. It but wasn't... Until he got concerned about succeeding. Until he got... Oh, well... Yeah, and Alan thought well, that it would send credit markets crazy when we were, you know... Well, Alan had a road to Damascus conversion experience about that issue um, mm -hmm. in the first month of Mr. Bush's term. But, but prior to that yeah. conversion experience, the first <laughs> best use of the public sector surplus was to delever the public sector. Now, as a practical matter, you were delevering the per public sector, i.e. running surpluses, because you were sucking purchasing power out of the private sector. That is double entry bookkeeping. That the private sector was running a deficit with the government if the government's going to be running a surplus with the private sector. And that was in the height of what was described that became even worse later of the private sector levering up into a state of pathology. But I bring that up because that was literally 15 years ago when the theology of public debate was that public investment had become a oxymoron. That the best investment that Uncle Sam could make with his surplus was not to make an investment at all. It was to delever his balance sheet. And that was also in the context that at the end of the day, the public sector, particularly the federal public sector, is always the most credit worthy mm -hmm. borrower in existence because the federal government has a printing press for money and Ben gets his ink for free. So that's the theology that we're inheriting, that public investment is an oxymoron. And so when we talk about public investment now 15 years ago, we have to remember that history. And one of the history I remember in public investment is that my dad, who's 86 years old, was one of the youngest veterans of WW2. He went in in 44 at 18 years old, went to college, and bought his first house that I grew up in on the GI Bill. The GI Bill was quintessentially public investment. My dad wouldn't have gone to college and wouldn't have bought a house, and the same a great deal of other. Now, the GI Bill facilitated private sector leveraging with a government guarantee. And we had a great run in the 50s and the 60s. We also did the Marshall Plan, which was a form of public investment. So this country, for those of us with graying hair, did have a period where public investment wasn't an oxymoron, but was a solution. The pendulum swang dramatically the opposite direction to the end of the second. But that was also 45% of GDP. Well, it, 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 you, had, you had a nice starting point. Yeah. And now we're coming, I'll, I'll come to the conclusion, and now we're at a point where 
the private sector is delivering. Not very much. Thank not you. very much. Thank you. But is going in that direction. The private sector is at least <coughs> going in that direction. And the economic consequence is straightforward, which means that public investment shouldn't be an oxymoron. Yes, we have large public debt, but it's the most secure public debt being borrowed at 2% for 10-year terms. So yeah, there's an incredible scope for public-private, just like GI Bill was public-private, public-private ventures into investment that have a societal payoff. No private lender would have lent money to my dad to go to college. Society invested in my dad. Uh, so that sort of state of mind of public investment needs very much a resurgence. And I think starting with good data on the reality starts that debate. And actually, I, I see a bit of a transformation going on uh, in Washington. Maybe Steve can tell me I'm just looking at it in rose-colored glasses. But this notion of austerity yesterday, the day before, and maximum amount is no longer getting traction in the political corridor, I think. Let me shut up right there. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to, on your point about your father, you, know, you, you made the point that, that the government invested in him. And, and I would maybe characterize that as your father providing ultimate public service, which is beyond the war. And at some level, I think that forgiveness is a, is a solution, is an interesting idea, but I think there has to be some relation of that to public service. So if somebody has debt forgiven, I don't know how to figure the system out. But you just don't have the debt to get it. You have to do something. You have to provide some value. You have to teach. We talked about it, a skills gap you know, during lunch. And to the extent that people who aren't working have certain skills that they can teach. So there's some formulation around that. Um, we want to be talking about debt forgiveness. You, you have to do something, all of us, to earn that opportunity. So I just wanted to relate that to your point because it's is, is an investment that's one way to characterize it, but I would characterize it as the only support for providing the type of public service. And, and I wouldn't disagree with that, particularly from the standpoint of political saleability, is that if, this, if society at large is going to get you out underneath <laughs> your debt burden, right. then society has some degree of get a payback and you pair the two up. But what I know, unlike the case in capitalism, or the company, in any of my, the companies I'm involved with or these fellows are involved with, if you've got an, if you happen to right-size your business, which involves right-sizing your payroll, otherwise known as firing people, <laughs> once you fire them, they're no longer part of your payroll and you move on. Society can't fire citizens. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference. The public sector can never run like the private sector because you can't fire citizens. Unless we as a country are going to say, we're going to fire you as a citizen, we're going to have to somehow feed you, and therefore we need to have a different mindset than the capitalist notion because I fire people, I'm sure you fire people, and you may keep in touch with them, but you no longer give them anything. Society can't fire citizens. I'm thinking about the uh, payback, Dom, and what do you put these people in the, uh, as financial literacy counselors? That, uh, <laughs> but but I, I would be, I, I'd be careful. You know, we, we, we were in an environment, you know, you guys are all familiar with Toyota and just-in-time production. We had, we sold America the notion that we had a just-in-time uh, economy, just-in-time cash, just-in-time jobs, just-in-time credit. That they that they if they lost their job today they could get tomorrow. Things were there was so much trust built up, too much, and that was a you know here's what I I have I, I respect what you're saying I think it sounds cool but here's what I don't like about it because when we were bailing out financial institutions 
I think it was wrong of the government to automatically think that because you were bailing out and using private tax dollars to get those institutions back into financial health, that they were somehow going to, the incentives were going to change, that they were all of a sudden going to turn into good citizens and solve other public goods problems than the fact that we were just resuscitating them to get back to what they were doing. Within one year of TARP, you had over 5,000 people at bailed out firms getting million dollars or more in bonuses. And what were they doing? Going back it. Now, people might say, wow, that's, that's abhorrent. Fact is, it worked because what you needed to do at that moment was resuscitate those institutions. But I also, what I want from that private, private uh, loan holder is I don't blame that loan holder. We're, we're basically making a moral judgment and saying they made bad economic choices because they were convinced it was a just-in-time economy and they went out and took these loans which they couldn't sustain. That's not true. You basically had decisions being made in a certain way. I want to get that person back working, uh, paying their, you know, mowing their lawn, keeping their neighborhood healthy, and doing all the things. I don't want to add on more burdens that they somehow have to pay back. I want them to do exactly what they were doing before the crisis hit, which is working, paying taxes, raising their kids, and creating healthy communities. That is what we should be expecting. And today, with 160% of private sector GDP and so much debt load, you're not getting that. You can't get that. So I, I would just be very, I, I like the notion of public service, but I don't want to make that a price tag, put that as a burden to basically get back the components of the stakeholders in the economy to behave as they should. Tom, what did you have to say? That's very interesting. Mary? Back here, sorry, I'll stand up and short. <laughs> very fascinating, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, putting the presentation together. Assuming all of these messy details get worked out and restructuring is the answer, <coughs> what's the timetable? Have you done some investigation into you know, how quickly something like this would need to happen? What's over what? Uh, number of years would it need to take place in order for it to be as effective as you think it would be? If I had a magic wand, you'd do it now and you'd let yeah. the banks amortize the consequence. And it's, by the way, I think only 10 or 20 percent of this problem resides in banks. I think most of it is held by funds, institutions, securitizations outside of the banking system. And frankly, I think as I do the analysis of reserve contributions and loss recognition over the last, you know, six years, I think the banks have dealt with most of this problem. So I think it's, it's outside the banking institution where you need to do most of this. But if I had a magic wand, I'd make a trillion of it happen today, and I'd let the consequence spread over some fairly protracted period. Now, if you're asking me the practical question of how quickly do I think it could happen in our political, social, and economic system, I don't, I'm not optimistic at all. You know, there, there are some cases, you know, when the Financial Times uh, did a short write-up on, on our paper, they referenced something I didn't know about, which was that you're finding these weird cases uh, in communities around the country, like Stockton, California, where they're using e uh, instruments of eminent domain to basically compel these workouts. So they're basically using eminent domain to, okay, we're going to come in and basically take over these assets. So it's a seizure, if you will, and then forcing the, finan the, the holders of these things to basically work out a deal with the loan holders to keep them in their homes and working. It's a bizarre way to achieve some of what we're talking about. It's not palatable per se, but it's happening today in certain communities that are basically looking at how do they revitalize their communities that are becoming black hole tax drags uh, yeah. and whatnot. And so, you know, I'm sure that one of these will eventually work them way, their, their way up to a Supreme Court or something or larger courts, but it is happening. It might look it up. Ed Luce wrote about there, this. There's quite a bit of pushback on yeah. that for all kinds no, of reasons. No, it is. It may be pushback, but nonetheless, they're doing it. So, well, they're, I'm yeah. not sure they're getting away yeah. with it, and it's got a cost, obviously. Yes, yeah, right. Um, it's uh, a nasty way yeah. to do this. I, I think that uh, 
It will. I would go so far as to suggest it's always true that private debt levels at 150 plus percent are a drag. We've looked at a lot of countries. We talked about America a lot today. We've looked at a lot of countries. You know, I'd rather be at 125 percent, 100 percent. I think that's true now. I think that's true 20 years from now. No, but I think she's asking a different kind of question, which is, uh, we first of all, we we're in this over five years. Mm -hmm. um, and how long will it take to do something meaningful? And if you wait longer, does the ability or the options actually deteriorate by virtue of the fact that, for example, neighborhoods go rather than yes. a small set of homes? Right. And, and I, that's why, in my comments by implication, I want the second chapter. So, so what right. are we going to do, uh, as opposed to I got it. be nice? Yeah. If, I got right. it. Now, now, though the best example you have is Japan, where this happened in 1991, and 22 years later, Japan's still struggling. It's Japan, and in that time, Japan went from the second largest economy in the world to the third largest. Uh, not nearly the factor it was. Remember, in the 80s, you know, the 80s, we thought Japan was going to take over the world. You know, the cover of every magazine. Well, that was a debt-fueled deal. I think you can go sideways for a long, long time. And I think, to, if Tony's framed it right, it gets tougher to repair, you know, uh, mm -hmm. homes and neighborhoods yeah. uh, through the passage of time. Some of these homes that could have been salvaged after six months, you know, are effectively unusable homes here. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. If you've got to intervene, Early intervention tends to be less costly and more productive for recovery than late intervention. I want to take a question from uh, another very serious economist, an old friend, Gil Hebner. Question, uh, for Richard, uh, the first senior research, uh, serious the economist. <laughs> of the um, uh, private sector debt, the overhang of that in the economy, what is your assessment? Are we spinning our wheels with uh, with Macroeconomic uh, uh, monetary and fiscal policy is QE, QE whether two, three, or four. Is, 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 is that matter, or is, is it is, is it is it uh, impeded by the uh, the work that you've indicated in the private sector debt? You know, after looking at this very carefully over a lot of countries, uh, fairly deeply. I'm convinced that government spending does, can create growth. Uh, I don't think it's a particularly efficient way to create growth. I think government spending, the return on a dollar of government spending is a lot less than the return on a dollar of private spending. But I think it is a palliative. It's just an inefficient palliative. Now, Paul's going to jump all over on this one because, you know, uh, but, but it's not for naught. I don't, I don't disagree with that. Richard, the sum is preferred to less, even if it's inefficient. But you ask directly about QEs and the, the QE program that we have right now is the Fed is monetizing, literally printing money to buy $85 billion a month of government and government guaranteed securities. And essentially what it's doing is it's swapping new created money for securities. So the holder of the security now has newly created money. Mm -hmm. It works through the banking system. So the banking system has quote unquote excess reserves that are taller than this building. And for most of our lifetime, excess reserves were a trivial amount. So essentially, we have incredible excess liquidity in the banking system. And banks would love to have a lot of creditworthy borrowers to put those funds to work for. So it's not a supply side of the credit equation right now. It's a demand side. And QE, as it's currently operated, is munificent for the supply side of the liquidity and credit potential equation, but doesn't do anything about getting more credit-worthy borrowers. And the sad fact of the matter is the most credit-worthy borrower is the borrower emerging from bankruptcy 
because his prior debts have been forgiven. Sir. The, uh, the money multiplier on QE probably is less than one right now. It's not doing anything. I mean, high-powered money is just sitting there. It's like you're saying, it's uh, yeah, zero. Okay, well, I wasn't going to quite say that. But uh, if we look at the system as a whole, under the partner group banking system that we have, the only way to increase the monetary base is through an increase in debt. Is there, therefore, not an endogenous pressure to increase our debt simply because of lower efforts to affect our monetary base? And is that perhaps one of the fundamental problems that hasn't been discussed? Yeah, absolutely. It's all circular. Wait a second. The government government debt will serve just as well, and we've got plenty of that. Yeah. No. The government government debt will serve just as well, and we've got plenty of that, as as is evidenced by the fact mm -hmm. that this eighty five billion is essentially the government is 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 borrowing from the the Fed, who in turn buys it back and gives them dollars so that they can spend uh, on the government debt uh, that they just purchased. So the government is essentially printing money and paying off its bills. And, and so you don't need Nobody just sector. said. That's <laughs> <laughs> exactly what's going on. Um, just a couple more questions, I think. Uh, right over here, what's on this side? Yeah, one of the questions that I think I have, and this is something that the firm I work for has kind of been trying to think about, is that in a way, hasn't the decision about who pays already been made? Haven't our central banks and this kind of changing of the guard that we're seeing and the abandoning of inflation targeting means that effectively the creditor always does, <coughs> like they always do in every single post-credit bubble that you've seen, right? The creditor always pays, and it's happening, you know, in Europe, you know, Germany is, is going to pay. They, they have said that. Um, so I think what we're, what I'd be curious to get your feedback on, um, it's just this, you know, does that make sense? And are we witnessing, are we witnessing this changing of the, of the guard kind of in terms of central banks around the world, not just, not just Europe, obviously. And then, um, but also as we abandon inflation targeting, and there's a there's a big downside to inflation targeting. There's income inequality that we mm -hmm. think has been kind of driven, driven off. Um, and so are we missing this big kind of regime change, really? And that, you know, does that kind of square with, does that make sense, I guess, is, is effectively what I'm asking. You know, the, the, the creditor always pays, and they the, the central banks are basically telling us that is the case. Anybody? There's... I have to take that one. You okay. know that. Um, I figured as much. Um, it's a shared burden between the creditor and the debtor. But financially speaking, in the long run, you're right. Um, it's also true that the creditor class tends to be the 1%. So there is some moral justice to the creditor ultimately having to take a disproportionate share of the loss in restructuring debt. But I think we have to look at it from the standpoint, it's also, and, and Chairman Bernanke articulates this, and it's a very difficult argument, it is in the creditor's class, let me rephrase, it's in the 1% group's class, best interest to do so because you end up with a more vibrant economy after the event. And I've restructured debt as a creditor in a private company before, not because I wanted to be generous to the guy who couldn't pay me back, because I was trying to maximize the NPV of the overall equation. I'm sure all of you have made that type of restructuring with your nose held. It's not because I like you. It's in my best interest to do this. And let's restructure this thing and recast the thing. Let me have half your equity, by the way, on the way back. Uh, so I, I, I think you're right in your articulation. And for the wealthy in society who are creditors, there's some degree of justice to it. Um, and essentially, um, I think, monetary policy as is currently constructed facilitates that proposition. There's a big downside, and I think it's becoming more real and more political of dragging this thing out forever, of making the creditor class pay on the installment plan, which is essentially what's going on right now, because the creditor class is not just the 1%. It's the elderly. <laughs> And the elderly who live good, moral, proper, melon-like lives 
their entire lives are now being stuck where they don't want to buy stock and they don't want to buy junk bonds and they don't want to buy 30 years. That is a William Jennings Bryan.